Hey everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner, and today I'm going to do a before the review of the Dutch & Dutch 8C bookshelf speaker. To help me get through this, because those of you who know me know that I have ADD, I have brought my trusty printout of some of the specs, and I'm going to use this as a guide to walk through some of the main features of this speaker that I may not have a chance to get to when it comes time to do my objective and subjective review, which will be a little bit later. And I wanted to go ahead and kick things off a little bit earlier just to get you guys feasting for what's about to come up. This speaker is from Dutch & Dutch, out of the Netherlands. It is called the 8C. The C stands for cardioid. Now what that means is the speaker basically is completely forward firing except for the low frequencies, which we'll discuss a little bit more in a minute. Looking around online, I find the price to be at about $12,000 per pair. I was loaned this pair of speakers for review by Dutch & Dutch because I reached out to them, expressed my interest and my desire to learn a little bit more about them and get some hands-on experience with them. I was set up with a US representative he actually brought them to my house and set them up for me as far as putting them on the stands and all of that stuff, which made me feel a little bit more at ease because Lord knows I didn't feel comfortable handling a pair of speakers that cost this much money. These are outside of my, uh, my means by a huge margin. But I really was looking forward to testing these because of the science and the technologies that's packed into them, which again, we'll discuss shortly. And with that said, I do want to give Dutch & Dutch a, a big thank you for allowing me to, to do this. While this isn't intended to be my review review, I'll just go ahead and tell you right now that these speakers are incredible. They do things that I have yet to hear any other speaker do. And quite honestly, I'm not sure how they're able to do that based on my preconceived notion of how they work. And I'll be curious to see once I'm able to do the measurements, how I'm able to correlate what I'm hearing in the room with what the measurements are showing. For example, with these speakers being the way they are, they are mostly forward firing, as I said earlier. And with that in mind, I was expecting maybe um, not so much a lot of soundstage width because I expected that I'm gonna lose some of the reflections off the side walls and I'm not getting that. In fact, the soundstage width out of these speakers is by far, I mean, easily the largest that I've heard from any speaker I've tested to date. And my mind doesn't quite comprehend why yet. And this gives me the opportunity when I review these to understand why. So with all of that said, I'm gonna go through some of the specs from this spec sheet that I printed out online. And we're gonna walk through some of those aspects. First off, this is a fully active speaker, which means you do not need an external amplifier to power it. It is ran off an internal Class D amplifier, and I don't recall the exact model off of it, but I'll try to have that information for you in the final review. For those of you in the US, the size of this speaker is about 19 by 10 and a half by 15 inches. What is that? Height, width, and depth. This is a very large bookshelf speaker. No, my head is not really, really small. This really is just is a large bookshelf speaker. It's also quite heavy at about 57 pounds, so it's gonna need a very sturdy, stand if you're going to use it on a stand or some kind of bookshelf system. For driving it, you have an 8-inch mid-range and a 1-inch dome tweeter and a very large waveguide. I believe the waveguide is about 8 inches, but I'll confirm that for my next review later. And that's actually very important to keep in mind because that waveguide matching the drive unit for the mid-range is really important when it comes to directivity matching. And on the back side, let me spin this around. What you see is two eight inch subwoofers. Now the crossover for these subwoofers is about 100 Hertz. And so the subwoofers play 100 Hertz and below and spinning it back around. And then the mid range plays from 1000 Hertz up to 1250 Hertz where the tweeter takes over. Given that this is an active design, the front speakers are playing at about 250 Watts a piece and the rear speakers are playing at about 500 Watts a pair. Now when I spun this around, you probably caught on to this and thought to yourself, what is that? Well, that's a vent. What does it do? Well, that's where all the trickery comes in for this speaker, and that's what gives it its cardioid pattern. And by the way, it's cardioid or cardioid, and it's a really funky word, so I'm probably gonna butcher it a few times, and I'm probably gonna say it differently than you do. Understand that I'm meaning the exact same thing, no matter which way I'm saying it. The point of this speaker is to cancel out the rear waves. 
What rear waves? Well, the rear waves from the mid-range. Well, what about all the other waves? Well, that's the cool thing about it. See, in most speakers, what you have is a 360 degree pattern. Well, I'll tell you what, let me draw this out. Maybe make it a little bit easier. Let's say you have a standard speaker. Now we're gonna look at it from the top. So this is a bird's eye view, okay? And we're gonna draw the speaker. It's gonna be like that. And this is gonna be the front side. And this is gonna be the back. Typically what you have with low frequencies, the sound is omnidirectional because the sound is longer, much longer than the wavelength of the drive units that are playing. And with high frequencies, the sound becomes more directional. So we're gonna say something more along the lines of that. And then the higher you go, the more directional you get. By the time you get to like 10 or 20 kilohertz, you're, you're basically doing one of these. I mean, you're just firing in a narrow sweet spot, typically. Now this is my example for the 8C. And the difference here is I'm gonna just color. Maybe there's a happy Side tree. Okay. Evergreen tree, he lives right there. Here's a little side vents for the 8C. Now with a typical speaker, again, you have all the low frequencies playing all around, but what happens with this speaker is, let's say that it were playing all the way around low frequencies, right? But these little side vents, what they do is they come in and they cancel all the sound that's being thrown backwards. They just cancel it out. Cancel it out, right? And then you're left with front firing sound from 100 hertz and up. To recap, what that means is everything from 100 hertz and above is coming from the front of this speaker. And the reason for that is because the side vents block the low frequencies from the mid range to going rearward and then bouncing off a wall or doing something else behind them. Everything from 100 hertz and up goes forward. 100 hertz and below, from the subwoofers would ideally be placed near a wall, hit the wall, provide boundary reinforcement to give you additional gain, and then come forward. And via the DSP that's built into these speakers, you can time align the rear subwoofers to the front speakers and provide a single cohesive wave front coming forward to you from the speakers. And to be clear, when I say time align, it's really a simple setting. You pull up the DSP menu via the landspeaker.com and you tell the software how far your speaker is placed from the rear wall and then it takes care of the rest. So for those of you who are adverse to DSP, it's really a simple process. And I'll talk more about that when I do the official review later. And unlike most bookshelf speakers where you would have to put those out from a wall in order to provide the best sound response you possibly can in a room, with these, you actually want to put them closer to a wall. And the reason you do that with these speakers is to improve the bass. But why can you do that with these speakers and not other speakers? Well, again, it goes back to the cardioid pattern. Because there's no rear mid-range energy throwing backwards and it's all going forward, you don't have to worry about any issues due to rear wall reflections. Everything is being put out forward above 100 hertz and that provides improvement in sound quality. Let's take a look at the back of the speaker and look at the inputs. Starting from left to right, you have subwoofer output. Now this subwoofer output has no preset filter. It basically is a pass-through XLR balance, so you can plug this into any old subwoofer or you can plug it into a full range signal if you wanted to. Then you've got the input, which can be used as XLR balanced or it can be used as AES digital input. Then you've got through, which would be if you have a stereo pair, this through acts as your AES digital output to your left or right speaker, depending on which way you plug these in. The through connection would be for your other speaker. So for example, if you're running AES digital, you would run into this speaker and then out to another speaker and you would do the out to part via the through channel. Then you have network. Now the network is really cool because it allows you to use your app or a, uh, another web device and go to, what is it, www.landspeaker.com, find this speaker on your internal network and then you can adjust its settings and it has a, a buku of settings. And buku is a funny word actually, I haven't used it in a long time. Uh, you have treble, mid-range and bass uh, shelving filters. Then you have the real brainchild of this speaker, which would be the ability for it to have uh, Room EQ Wizard filters loaded into it automatically like that. All you have to do is measure in-space response and then have REW calculate the filters 
and then you just spit it right out into the speaker. It literally took me five to 10 minutes tops from measurement to having these fully calibrated for my in-room. And I'll discuss more of that in my actual review. I just wanted to mention it here. Now, as far as protection circuits go, this has DC clipping and it has thermal overload protection as well, which in my uses so far with running these for hours at a time, I've not run into any of those cases. Now, going back to the front panel, let's discuss more of that and the waveguide effect. Normally when you use an eight inch mid range, you're gonna get lobing effects, you're gonna get directivity, high directivity effects. Somewhere in the 800 Hertz region, it just depends on the actual effective diameter of the speaker, but you can take speed of sound, uh, half it, and then divide it by the effective diameter, and that will get you the, uh, the frequency at which this speaker starts to beam or become more directional. And for an eight inch, that's somewhere in like the 800 to 900 Hertz region, again, just depending on the exact diameter. And typically when you use an eight inch in a two way, that's no bueno. There are, however, exceptions to that rule, and typically that exception is found when you use a wave-guided dome tweeter. Now, you almost always see that kind of um, implementation with a one-inch dome, or maybe even a little bit larger, like a one-and-a-quarter-inch dome tweeter. And the reason for that is because that dome tweeter has to be able to cross low enough to mate well with the dispersion pattern of the eight inch woofer itself. Again, it's beaming at around 800, 900 Hertz. So that speaker has become more directional well before a typical dome tweeter can be crossed over because most dome tweeters, one inch size, don't like to be crossed over below 2000, 2500 Hertz at, at best. I mean, typically that's kind of the, the 2000 is minimum. And this tweeter is crossed over at 1.25 kilohertz. How are they doing that? Well. For one thing, they're able to waveguide it and horn load that speaker. And what that means is that when you horn load a speaker, you're able to give it a little bit of boost on the bottom end. And in order to do that, all you've got to do is just fit that speaker down into a horn type pattern. Problem is that horn type has to have a good waveguide and that waveguide has to match up with the characteristics of the driver that's used below it for the mid-range, mid-bass duty. And in this case, that's an eight inch. And it looks to me, just by judging from the size of this, that this waveguide is about the same size as the effective diameter of this speaker. So I'd say the waveguide is probably in that seven, seven inch region, which should provide you with very good pattern matching to this eight inch mid range. And based on what I'm hearing, I'd say that's the case. But you all know that I love objective data and we're gonna see just how well the pattern matching mates up at the crossover region when I'm able to do the objective testing and provide that analysis. And before I leave, one thing I also wanna mention is the aesthetic of the speaker. Now they come in a variety of different colors and I was able to get this uh, white finish on the oak shell and the white front finish. I'll also note too that if you look at this from the side, you notice there's a seam here. That's because this front baffle is placed on after the fact. So this speaker is built up, you put the drive units in, and then you load that front baffle on. So that way it's all one big piece. There's no screw holes in here. I can't really call it a pet peeve because I understand why manufacturers do this. But whenever I see a really good waveguide with big old screw heads sticking up out of it, I'll always think to myself, why? With it being as an expensive speaker as it is, being realistic here, you wouldn't expect that it would have you know, screw head sticking up out of it. But the fact that they actually took the time and they took the care and they understand the importance of how the waveguide needs to be developed and not to have screw head sticking up out of it, that's a big deal to me. I wish I had the ability to measure objectively the effect of screw heads in a waveguide because I, there's no doubt in my mind that it creates issues. Now, to what degree? Who knows, you know, it depends on the placement of the screw heads from the actual um, center of dispersion and, and how they how far they stick out and all that stuff. But I don't wanna go off on a tangent. I just wanna note that you don't see any screw heads sticking up out of the speaker. This is a single one piece baffle that is laid on top of these speakers to help reduce any diffraction effects and help smooth that control directivity from the wave guided tweeter. That's gonna do it for this video. I just wanted to introduce you to some of the features that I may not have the opportunity to discuss when it comes time to do the actual subjective and objective review because those tend to run rather long as is and this probably is gonna add another 10 minutes into it. So I hope you learned something cool about this speaker. I know I'm certainly having some fun getting to listen to it. It is an incredible speaker and I really do look forward to providing you with my subjective thoughts and the follow-up, the objective data 
and the correlation there in between. In the meantime, if you guys want to check out more about the speaker, I will throw a link to their website below in the description box. So just click on that and go do your thing. And also, if you don't mind, give this thing a thumbs up and uh, hit the subscribe button and notification bell if you're not already a subscriber. If you are, I appreciate it. And let's help spread the word about cool speakers and objective data because that's very important to me. And with that said, I'm out. I hope you guys have a great one. Peace.